because I would like to uh, introduce our speaker for tonight, Kayla Osterhorst, who is actually a, a student, was a student in uh, mind-body medicine, but she had the specialization in applied psychophysiology and did a phenomenal job on her dissertation. And we asked her to come back and sh share that with you tonight. So, Dr. Olsenhoff, would you like to do a little more introduction of yourself and uh, take it away? And I will make you a presenter and uh, you can lead us for the rest of the evening. Sure. Um, thank you for having me back and inviting me. I'm um, excited to see all of these fresh faces in the Applied Psychophysiology program. So keep going. You'll get to the end soon. It goes by faster than you think. Um, so uh, my name is Kayla Osterhoff. Um, I focus primarily on women's health in my career, in my research, and in, in my work, um, and specifically women's neuropsychophysiology. And so that's what I did my dissertation on, which is called uh, Mapping Neurophysiological Biometrics through the female menstrual cycle. So I'm going to present that um, to you today. And um, I will also be happy to share the slides with anyone if you would like afterwards, I can share them with, um, with Dr. Bullmarth and then he can you know provide them to whoever is interested if you would like them. So we will go ahead and do it. Okay, I'm going to do this and make my Brady Bunch square small, just a moment. Okay, great. So um, as I mentioned, this is the title of my dissertation research. The problem that I was addressing, and really this is the focus of my entire career, is the fact that women represent the largest um, gap in our health science research that still exists today. And this fact um, has been since the beginning of research, but it was perpetuated specifically by the 1977 FDA ban um, of women being left out of clinical research, which actually remained in effect until 1993, if you can believe it, if you don't know that already. Um, and even since 1993, when women were allowed into clinical studies, um, they still have not been appropriately included in the studies. And when they have been included in the studies, we this research is not typically reported by sex. So we have a huge gap in our scientific understanding of human biology and physiology when it comes to women specifically. Um, and the majority of our research is that is dedicated to women specifically is relegated to reproductive health, um, which is what women's health technically has been boiled down to. Um, if you remember back into your biology classes, or even if you look in your current, um, any kind of physiological textbooks, you'll see that every model within those books are the male model. And that the female model is only represented in, in uh, terms of reproductive health. Um, so, Due to this gender gap in research, women's physiology and the biological complexity that results from the female hormone cycle is not well understood. And in fact, that biological complexity resulting from our female hormone cycle is the reason why we are left out of the research to begin with. So it's kind of this um, perpetuating negative cycle. Um, I included this slide because this is not a new issue. This is something that has been in um, in published in uh, papers, white papers, and in major media around the globe, especially with a focus in the US, basically since the late 1990s. However, little to no progress has been made. And on this slide, I actually included two new um, articles, one of which is a on the top right um, is 
a new executive order that came out of the White House to advance women's health research. And this is an effort to close these gender gaps in research. So um, anyone who is interested in doing women's health research, I implore you to search um, the NIH and other granting um, uh, organizations for research. Um, over the next five years, there will be $13 billion being um, offered to women's health research specifically. So that's something to keep an eye out for. Um, and then I thought this one that just came out last week from National Geographic, it says scientists are finally studying women's bodies. Ooh, wow, amazing. This is what we're learning. So I thought that was um, kind of interesting. So the purpose of, of my research specifically was to explore the physiological effects of the female hormone phases of the menstrual cycle beyond reproduction. And so this was by measuring and mapping neurophysiological biometrics across three distinct hormone cycle phases, which were the menstrual phase, the late follicular phase, the mid and the mid luteal phase. Um, and this was to better understand the monthly female biological rhythm that is broader than the hormone cycle. So by mapping these neurophysiological biometrics across the menstrual cycle, I was able to address the following research questions. So my research was split into two because I essentially did two separate dissertations in one. So the first dissertation or the first part is research questions one through eight. And this focuses on um, the uh, essentially aut autonomic uh, biometrics. And so research question one was, are there differences in women's heart rate variability as measured by a wristband wearable device between the menstrual, late follicular, and mid luteal uh, hormone cycle phases? And then the following research questions two through eight are the same, but with a different biometric. So I also did resting heart rate, respiration rate, blood oxygen, saturation, arterial elasticity, uh, light sleep, deep sleep, and sleep efficiency. The second part of my dissertation was a small case series, and this was just with three subjects uh, looking at their EEGs across the three hormone cycle phases across three menstrual cycles, so three months. And this was questions nine through 13. Um, question nine was, are or what differences exist in the women's default mode network EEG activity between the menstrual, late follicular, and mid luteal hormone cycle phases as based upon pattern analysis? And then questions 10 through 13 um, were the same using different metrics. So I also looked at the salience network, the pain network, the memory network, and the depression network. The reason why I chose these specific networks to look at are because these networks have been shown in the previous research within the last about five years to have a significant differentiation versus our male counterparts. And what we understand to be responsible for the differences in these specific areas of the brain are that there are higher densities of estrogen and progesterone receptors in these specific areas of the brain. That's why these were the areas that were of interest to me. The methodology consisted of collecting daily autonomic biometrics, and that was you know, for the first part of the dissertation, uh, from 40 normally cyc cycling female participants using the BioStrap wearable, which is um, FDA registered, and, um, and phase-based EEGs from three of those participants, so for the case series, using the neuron spectrum three across three full menstrual cycles, so three months. The examination um, of within differences in HRV, resting heart rate, or um, yeah, resting heart rate, respiration rate, blood oxygen saturation, arterial elasticity, sleep, and EEG activity between the three different phases of the menstrual cycle were examined. Um, the analysis that were used was a repeated measures NOVA logistic regression and pattern analysis. Um, I'm going to skip over how the data was handled. Uh, again, if you're interested in diving deeper into that, um, you, I'll share the slides. But let's get to the results because this is the fun part. So um, 
the first part of the results, I split up the results in different ways of looking at it. So the first way that I wanted to look at the results were by menstrual cycle phase. So we have P1 is phase one, which is the menstrual uh, phase. P2 is the follicular phase and P3 is the luteal phase. So um, in phase one, what I found was that there was a consistent lower resting heart rate and sleep efficiency compared to the mid-luteal phase, along with notable alterations in the default mode network delta connectivity. So we'll get more into the details of that um, in a moment. Um, in phase two, the, the notable um, findings were that uh, there was the highest heart rate variability in this phase, lowest resp respiration rate, and an increased deep sleep compared to the menstrual phase. And this was along with notable changes in the salience network and pain network beta connectivity. In the third phase, which is the luteal phase, this um, phase exhibited the lowest heart rate variability, highest respiration rate, highest resting heart rate, and decreased deep sleep compared to the late follicular phase. And along with that, there were notable changes in the default ne mode network, delta and alpha connectivity, and also the pain network, beta connectivity. So now let's look at the findings by research question. So question one was, um, heart rate variability, were there differences between the three menstrual cycle phases? And what we found was that there was a st statistically significant difference. Um, so this I also visualized in a couple of different ways so that you can um, see what's going on overall. And then you can see uh, phase to phase um, these changes as well. Um, even when there wasn't a statistically significant difference, I still wanted to look visually to see what the patterns were. So on the left-hand side, what you can see here is that um, phase two is significantly higher heart rate variability and phase three significantly lower heart rate variability. This goes along with previous research findings on heart rate variability um, as it relates to estrogen and progesterone levels. Typically, heart rate variability is higher in higher uh, estrogen states and lower in um, low estrogen states and higher progesterone states. So that's the follicular phase is higher estrogen and the uh, luteal phase is, is lower estrogen. And so we found the, the same findings here. It, for the second question, we looked at resting heart rate and we found that there was a statistically significant difference. Um, again, for resting heart rate on the left-hand side, you can see overall that the resting heart rate was highest in phase three. So um, if you think about uh, heart rate variability versus heart rate, you know that heart rate variability um, has uh, to do with kind of the quality of the nervous system or how taxed the nervous system is and resting. And so when heart rate variability is higher, it um, shows that there is more capacity, you could say, of the nervous system. Um, and when heart rate variability is lower, we typically see a higher resting heart rate, um, a higher uh, heart rate. So that al also went along with the um, previous findings of other research. Respiration rate was the third biometric that we looked at, and um, there was not a, st a statistical um, significant difference. However, it is interesting to look at the patterns. So on the left-hand side, you can see there's not, there really is not much of a difference between phases. However, on the right-hand side, um, what you can see is the number of participants whose respiration rate decreased is in uh, purple, and the number of participants whose respiration rate increased is blue. So you can see between phase one and phase two, most of the participants' respiration rate increased there. 
And then between phase two and phase three, most of the participants' respiration rate decreased, or sorry, increased. Um, so it's, it is an interesting notable pattern in those first two phases. And then between P3 and P1, so the last phase and the first phase, um, you can see it's kind of a mixed bag. So not really anything to note there. Um, what the next one we looked at was blood oxygen saturation, and there was no statistical significant difference. But again, I wanted to look at the pattern analysis um, on the left hand side uh, there. You can see it's very little change between phases on the right hand side, um, the between phase one and phase two and phase two and phase three, um, again, there's not that big of a, of a difference, not a notable change. Um, but then in uh, between phase three and phase one, it looks like most of um, the participants had a decrease in blood oxygen saturation. Um, we looked at arterial elasticity next, and there was not a statistical significant difference. Same on the left-hand side, you can see very little change. Um, and on the right-hand side, the only really notable change here is that between phase one and phase two, most of the participants are arterial elasticity uh, decreased. Um, light sleep was the next one. Uh, again, no statistical significant difference. And um, if you look at the pattern analysis, it's also showing that there really is not much of a, a pattern to be observed either. Deep sleep, um, no statistical uh, difference. However, there was a notable um, pattern here. If you look at the left-hand side, you can see between phase one and phase two, um, deep sleep did uh, increase. And between phase two and phase three, deep sleep decreased. Again, if you think back to the pattern of the heart rate variability and the uh, resting heart rate, this makes sense um, in terms of what you would expect to see. Um, the next one was sleep efficiency. So this is a metric of basically how long does it take you to fall asleep? Um, and so there, again, was no statistically significant difference. Um, and on the left-hand side, you can see there is very little difference. On the right-hand side, it's about the same. It, it's kind of a mixed bag there. So no real notable difference that I would want to look further into. Um, so for question nine, we looked at the default mode network. And again, this was for the case series. And the pattern analysis revealed that there was a repeating default mode network connectivity change pattern for all three cases. So um, the patterns that were pulled from the data, which um, was an overwhelming amount of data and an overwhelming amount of charts to look through, the ones that were pulled um, and included in the results were ones that, um, that there was a significant repeating change that happened across all three phases and then for each of the participants as well. So um, the patterns that repeated for the default mode network, you can see on the left-hand side, so case 18, 19, and 25 were the three cases that were included in the case series um, that we took their EEGs over the course of three months. And for case 18, delta coherence, delta phase, and beta three coherence showed a repeating pattern. For case 19, beta one coherence and alpha two phase showed a repeating pattern. And for case 25, alpha two coherence and delta phase showed a repeating pattern. Um, it's way too many charts and too much confusing data to show all of them. So I just pulled one example so you can get an idea and a feel for what this data looks like. Um, so this is case 18 default mode network delta variation in phase across the cycle phases with eyes closed. So what you can see here is a pretty um, obvious repeating pattern that was really interesting that happened across the three um, phases, repeated through the phases. So, um, you know, you can see it visually here with this uh, pattern that repeats 
through each of the cycles. So each cycle contains three phases. So essentially this is cycle one, and then this starting here is cycle two, and then this starting here is cycle three. So you can see between P1 and P2, there's a decrease. Go over here to P1 and P2, again, all decrease. Between P1 and P2 in the third cycle, decrease. So that's how the pattern analysis was um, conducted. For the salience network, we I found that there was a pattern um, that repeated in the salience network connectivity um, across all three cases. Again, so case 18, we saw a beta three phase um, pattern. In case 19, beta one coherence and high beta coherence, and then case 25, theta coherence and alpha two phase. Um, so with this one, <clears throat> again, if you look at the overarching pattern, you can see that there's a repeating pattern, although this first cycle looks a little different than the others. However, if you look between P1 and P2, there's an increase, right? P1 and P2, again, all increased and P1 and P2 all increased. Um, and these are all the locations on, on this side here. Um, not that that means anything to you by looking at the location, but in the actual dissertation, I talk about what these locations are in relation to and what it might mean um, with these patterns. Um, and then for the pain network, there was a repeating pattern that we saw with case 18 and case 19. So delta phase, beta three phase, and beta one coherence. And this is an example with case 18, beta three. And then with question 12, we looked at the memory network and we saw repeating patterns only in case 18. Um, the other two cases did not show repeating patterns in the memory network. And that was with delta phase and delta coherence. Um, with the depression network, there were no repeating patterns that observed that were observed with any of the um, cases. Now, I wanna mention here that <clears throat> This was not an exhaustive review because that would take 25 years to do, um, to look at every single location and, and, and search for these patterns. Um, so what I did was find the top, uh, or top five most dysregulated um, uh, locations. And then I looked at those same five across um, all the areas that we were looking at. Um, and so that ended up resulting in, I can't remember now it's, it's, um, in my dissertation, but it ended up resulting in, uh, something crazy, thousands and thousands of, um, of plots that I had to review and, um, and look for these. And out of those, the ones that showed these repeating patterns were included in the results. <clears throat> So there were some commonality across the cases in the EEG portion, the case series of the dissertation. And so I wanted to note those because it is quite interesting um, that all three cases had these specific repeating patterns that happened across the menstrual phases and across cycles. So with the default mode network and the salience network, um, they consistently exhibited distinct changes in connectivity patterns between the menstrual cycle phases, suggesting that there might be a shared hormonal influence on these specific brain networks. Um, patterns in the brain areas involved in memory, language, and motor function. So again, I mentioned how um, the locations, looking at all those various numbers, don't really mean much when you're looking at them here. But when you look at where um, which Broadman pairs these are, and which area, which Broadman areas of the brain they are, um, it showed a significant pattern that where these locations were showing up were in areas of the brain that are involved in memory, language, and motor functions across all three um, cases. So that was really interesting. And then across all three cases, the anterior cingulate gyrus showed um, consistent connectivity alterations across the menstrual phases, which suggests that maybe this 
um, particular region of the brain is sensitive to the ovarian hormone variations. Um, limitations of the study, um, difficulty in accurately identifying the participants' menstrual phases. Um, this goes back to the issue that we were talking about at the beginning, this, this gender gap in our health research. Um, because of that, there are very inconsistent definitions of what the menstrual phases are. And because women are so variable, um, women have all kinds of different menstrual cycles, lengths, and qualities. Um, there really almost can't be uh, very specific definitions that cover all women um, because there's just too much uh, variation. So that was a little difficult to deal with. Um, and then the lack of control for external factors. Um, had I had unlimited resources and time, I could have controlled for at least some of the external factors, including diet, uh, you know, other lifestyle things, sleep, stress level, career, education level, all of these different things. I couldn't control for those, um, again, just because of limited resources and time. Um, technology and user error limitations are always possible when you're using tech. I used wearable technology and EEG technology. There's always limitations when it comes to that. <clears throat> And then um, also because of limited resources, um, I was not able to measure daily hormone levels, which would have been uh, made um, the identification of the phases a lot more accurate and would have also made the identification of a normal menstrual cycle more accurate had I been able to measure estrogen and progesterone every day across um, three months for every subject. That would be ideal. Um, I, again, you know, couldn't control for certain lifestyle factors and then could not provide full oversight um, of the data collection process because the women were, uh, the 40 participants were wearing a um, wristband wearable and I checked in with them um, very often. However, uh, a lot of times, you know, there's issues with the tech and they don't tell you right away. And so you find out a couple of days later and you miss a couple of days of data. Imagine that across 40, uh, 40 participants, it's like herding cats. It was, it was pretty difficult as one person. Um, and uh, I, again, only mapped the top five most dysregulated Broadman pair locations for coherence and phase only. There's a lot more that could be looked at, um, not only just from my data set, but from other data sets and, and research moving forward. Again, the big challenge is going to be identifying those menstrual cycle phases and making sure that the data was collected at the appropriate phase for every single subject. That was another big hurdle. Um, <clears throat> And of course, I cannot generalize uh, these results for clinical populations, so um, neurological issues, mental health conditions, things like that. So conclusions, uh, contributions of this research. The findings of the study provide compelling evidence of discernible patterns in brain activity and autonomic responses throughout the menstrual phases, which underscore the intricate relationship between the ovarian hormone shifts and global neurophysiological processes in women. Um, by delving beyond the conventional perceptions of the female hormone cycle as slow, solely within the context of reproduction, this study sheds light on the multifaceted relationship between the female neurophysiology and the menstrual cycle. Um, it provides a foundation for which future research endeavors in the fields of women's neuropsychophysiology can build upon and um, from which the female biological rhythm can be better understood versus the male biological rhythm, which we understand uh, a lot better. Um, it also highlights the need for more robust research in this realm, which I'm happy that there is attention being uh, served here and there is money and resources going into this field. So again, anyone who is interested or thinking about studying women, please do it. Um, there's resources and support out there and let's contribute to closing this gender gap in our research. And that is all. Thank you very much. That's just as impressive as it was during your orals. <laughs>
um, if you want to, yeah, going back to here, we can let uh, open up to any questions from the uh, the students. Sure. How did you? Hey, Kayla, good job on your mm -hmm. on your incredible work right there. Um, much needed. Thank you. It's nice to see. It's nice to use you using BioStraf. You know, I I'm familiar with them. Um, right. Yeah, it's it's cool. Yeah. It's kind of like a my alley with the biohacking people and all that kind of crowd. Mm -hmm. but how yeah. did you do the um the EEGs? Did you do it yourself? So you use only three people, right? So only three people, but it ended up being nine EEGs per participant, and it oh. had to be done at each menstrual cycle phase, which was different for each one. So that part was also extremely difficult to schedule and, um, you know, get each participant to come in at that specific time of their cycle three times a month for three months. Um, so I started doing them myself and quickly realized that th there was no way that mm -hmm. I could handle that. Um, so I hired a clinic that was able to do it for me, who that is fully staffed and they work, you know, um, long business hours. So they were able to um, have the participants come in when they were scheduled during that part of their phase. And the um, the same technician was taking their EEGs that worked there full time. So I got very lucky with that, but it also was quite expensive to do that. It cost me several thousand dollars to to have that done. So again, one of the issues with studying women is that when you're studying women, there is no such thing as point in time measurements. You can't do that. You have to take measurements over several cycles in order for the information to really be accurate and viable. And if you're really being honest, you have to also report those findings by menstrual phase because the shifts that happen physiologically um, across the menstrual phases are so significant that you really want to um, report findings by menstrual phase as well. Could you explain a little bit like what the different menstrual phases mean? Because I think it's yeah. not necessarily like, you know, common knowledge. And then, yeah. um, and then maybe like uh, an important finding that you that you found from each of those phases. Sure. So um, the menstrual cycle phases that I looked at, I looked at three of four. Um, the first one that I looked at was the menstrual phase. So that is when women have their period, they're actively shedding the uterine lining. And hormonally, this is marked by the lowest levels of estrogen and progesterone. So these are the two key hormones of interest. And they're also the two <clears throat> key sex hormones for women that have a significant impact on the brain because there are high densities of estrogen and progesterone receptors in the female brain. Um, and that's what we're understanding has that modulatory effect on connectivity uh, phase um, and, and things like that. So um, phase one, menstrual, lowest hormones, lowest estrogen and progesterone. Phase two is the late follicular phase. So this is right before ovulation, right before about ovulation, estrogen is during that time is, is rising to a peak. Estrogen hits its peak at late uh, follicular phase. And so it's marked by high estrogen and low progesterone. So there's barely any progesterone, really high estrogen. So that's why that phase is of importance and notable. Then we move on to the mid luteal phase and it's kind of a flip. So mid luteal phase happen after, um, <clears throat> after ovulation, estrogen uh, has a stark decrease, but uh, progesterone starts rising. So once you get to the mid part of the luteal phase, which is the last phase of the hormone cycle, um, the progesterone has peaked and estrogen is low. So it's a flip of the hormones. So um, these are the, are the kind of hormonal checkpoints that are of most interest to most research because they're where the starkest contrast of those two hormones um, exist. So they're kind of like these hormonal checkpoints. Um, in the menstrual phase, um, 
there is not enough research done to know exactly what is shifting in terms of the brain. And what my research showed, um, it's hard to point to one specific thing, but if you zoom out and you look at the collective results, it is very clear that there are specific shifts that happen within the female brain in the three menstrual phases. And again, what we're understanding, but we barely have a grasp on this because there's so little data, is that those changes in the brain and in, in the brain functionality um, is is related to the influence of estrogen and progesterone on the brain through those um, receptors. So my research corroborates that um, and supports that, though there is much, much more research that needs to be done, so much more to explore. I could have explored endless possibilities um, just within my own data set. And so we really need a lot more done here, and it's going to take a lot of money to do it. Um, so that's why I'm happy that there are resources coming out for that. So, um, and then when with the physiological biometrics, um, there's a, a pretty good understanding of what happens, um, how the nervous system is modulated through the different hormonal phases. And again, it's related to the levels of estrogen and progesterone. Um, estrogen has a um, kind of increase in metabolic activity, um, it, or it's, it's correlated with the increase in metabolic activity and a higher capacity of the nervous system to handle stress. Um, and then when estrogen is low, uh, progesterone tends to be high. And so we don't understand exactly what is the role of, of high progesterone versus is it is it that or is it the fact that estrogen decreases? but there seems to be a kind of revving of the nervous system, a more sensitivity of the nervous system. So that's why we see uh, lower heart rate variability in the luteal phase versus the follicular phase. Um, we see higher respiration rate. Um, we typically see higher um, heart rate and uh, you know other physiological metrics that are related to more stress on the system. Uh, we see in the luteal phase versus the follicular phase when estrogen is higher. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. I really enjoyed your presentation and you did a uh, incredible study. Your you. uh, four dissertations in one are uh, really amazing. <laughs> Thank uh, you. I appreciate I, that. Two, two um, points to consider that aren't directly related to your dissertation. But the whole point to the cycle is getting ready to get pregnant, not to not get pregnant. Yeah. So if you want to see what's going on, you know, why the changes occur, look at the changes that occur when you do get pregnant. And um, some of that makes a lot more sense. Um, mm. The other thing is... Uh, the changes in hormones don't only affect, um, well, throughout the menstrual cycle, don't only affect uh, the uterus and whatnot. They affect elasticity throughout the body. Yes. So, um, for instance, um, in, in the luteal phase, uh, women athletes tend to have more sprained ankles. Mm-hmm than uh, otherwise. <clears throat> so there's all kinds of things to look at. Yeah. There's also, um, well, our, our lab looked at that years ago. The other thing that's fascinating to look at is uh, a lot of the behavioral changes that happen for the minority of women who have uh, terribly painful parts of their cycle. Mm -hmm. And that's worth investigating uh, what happens with behavior there. Because the, the military was uh, very, very concerned that if, since um, women's cycles are synchronized, if they live in a barracks, um, what if you have a lot of people 
who are having dysmenorrhea at the same time, what's that going to do to their judgment, their ability to uh, function within the military? And it turns out that they may be very crabby, but their judgment stays the same. Uh, the reason I'm well, going I'd, I'd also note for that. So um, PMS is something that has been normalized within our society because so many women experience it. However, it is not normal. It's actually dysfunction of the hormones. So yes. PMS only exists when um, progesterone specifically is um, is dysfunctional. So when there's not enough progesterone, that's when women are experiencing um PMS. So it's a dysregulation of the full global physiological system and especially the nervous system and cortisol regulation that causes that dysregulation. And then, um, you know, after many cycles, the PMS presents. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, th so the reason I'm bringing all this up is we've had a number of students and currently have another student doing uh, studies on the menstrual cycle. And I'm wondering if between our recent graduates and um, current students, if we have enough students to have an interest group. That would be great. Uh, studying the menstrual cycle. Um, well, count me in if you do, because I would love to stay abreast of this um, help in any way that I can. And again, um, everyone keep your eye out on the NIH is putting out calls for proposals. So um, potentially, I know that uh, Lorianne is doing menstrual cycle research for her dissertation. Um, you get a sense for how expensive and time consuming this can be. So I would apply for grants. Um, right now, especially because there's going to be a lot coming out in this area. Yeah. Excellent. Kayla, are you uh, intending to apply for some grants and continue this research? Yep. I already have my name in the hat for three grants right now and um, for different areas of, of female um, physiology research. And there's a lot more that is coming down the pike. Um, I also have private funding to do some other research. So this is this is my dedication of my career. So this is what I'll be doing for the rest of it. Yeah. And, and I'd like to respond to the ooze when you talked about, you know, costing $2,000 to have the, the clinic help you on that. When you think of the cost of tuition for a term, uh, $2,000 can be a really key investment to avoid an $8,000 charge uh, you run over a yeah. couple of <laughs> So you want to balance those things, but sometimes it's a better value. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Also remember the Behavioral Medicine Foundation can kick in up to $2,000 per dissertation. And they uh, did for me, thank goodness. Has. Uh, because I did use that. I said they did for me and thank goodness they did. Um, very grateful because uh, when you're doing this kind of research, your participants are burdened a lot. Um, so I had to provide uh, incentive to my um, uh, participants in order to get them to do it. And that was very helpful. And I just want to mention, don't forget about sponsored programs through ORISP. Uh, go search through your spin account um, to what Kayla's talking about on uh, some of these for uh, NIH, NSF, they'll pull up. Dissertation funding is there, but just make sure you have the leeway because you don't want to be, you know, just about to finish your dissertation and try to get a, a grant because it's not going to, you know, not going to work out for you because there is a leeway to get funding, you know, three to six months out. So just kind of remember that, but there are funding opportunities out there. Nick, do you want to say a little bit more about SPIN? First, I want to mention, uh, everybody knows I was I work in uh, op, uh, the Office of Research and uh, Research Innovation and Sponsored Programs. I am technically out of that position right now because I don't qualify for federal work study, but i am got my hand still in there through some different avenues. So SPIN is a database. It has over 40,000 
areas in that you can search for. But the trick is that you you need to kind of start broad and work down. Don't try to get too specific to look for which to look for um the areas that you're interested in. And I will urge everybody that's getting ready for dissertation to go into your spend account and type in dissertation funding and then go through and look. There are several opportunities under dissertation funding uh, to look at. And then if you need a one-on-one -on -one session, all you got to do is send an email to sponsored programs at saybrook.edu, and we'll help you out on that. Um, <clears throat> I do need to mention that if you're currently not attached as a faculty member, as an adjunct faculty, as a student, there's not an avenue for you to use SPIN right now. It's only for uh, active faculty and students, unless you collaborate, like Kayla, if you were to collaborate with a fellow student, the active student, then you would be able to use this to go for uh, SPIN funding as well. So just want to mention that and through sponsored programs, we'll be able to help everybody out. So take advantage of that resource. And um, Office of Research Innovation and Sponsored Programs is also putting on the website outside funding from SPIN because there are several funding opportunities that are not located within SPIN. So they're going to be starting putting links out there so you can go to those particular places to look at, especially in applied psychophysiology. There's some niche areas out there that are not included in the database because of the keywords are not there. They're trying to get the keywords submitted to the people who created SPIN, but we're going to be putting um, these links on, a, on the same page for other funding so you can uh, look for that. Well, thank you again, Kayla. It was a wonderful presentation. And please do stay thank in touch you as you uh, continue the process. And if there's anything we can do to help, let us know. Um, yes. I think it's a great example for the others of what, what can really be done in a dissertation. And um, although, you know, anybody that I'm chairing, I'm going to suggest that you do one dissertation at a time rather than four. Um, yeah, I suggest that too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. With that, we'll sign off for tonight, and we will see you all on the third Zoom. Yeah, Nick. Yeah, I just wanted to make one announcement. Um, I was talking to Rich and Cynthia on Monday night, and I'm getting um, some archival data to be used from the Department of Defense, the United States Army Aeromedical Research Lab, and their director wanted me to pass on that if there's any students at Saybrook that are that is interested in any in any archival data, there is a process that they will support us to for the students to use archival data for research. Now, mind you, it's uh, Department of Defense research um, application. A lot of it is in applying psychophysiological measures to actual real-time, real-life uh, type of operations that the military use, uses. But they have biofeedback data, EEG data, um, and and the heart rate heart rate variability, respiration. So there's all kinds of avenues there, but uh, they did want me to share with um, <clears throat> my colleagues here that if you are interested in using archival data, that there is a way to do that. And if there's a way, um, I have the forms to do that and um, can help guide you through that. And it will go through the Department of Research. Dr. Laura Brewer is the signatory to sign off on that for Saybrook. And so it, um, just wanted to make that announcement. Thank you. There's no quicker way through the IRB than using archival data. <laughs> mm. so. Any questions from anybody before we sign off? I just, I, no question, but I just want to say thank you, Kayla, so much for presenting your work. I'm new to Saybrook and just seeing the type of research you did, the quality of your work. Um, it was very interesting, but also just very inspiring to kind of thank think you. about, you know, the opportunities of what we can accomplish. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'd like to mention, um, in case um, you guys haven't seen, I posted on the um, chat, there's this new study. I can't believe I'm quoting Eric Pepper. <laughs> <laughs> um they just came up with the with the new um research that you know in my ad to 
to the work that you're doing on the on the differences in uh, stress profiles, male and female. So oh. there are differences. <laughs> yes, there are significant differences. <laughs> Amazing. I'm going to check that out. Thanks, Adelita, and especially thanks, Kayla. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.